Good afternoon, everyone. It is one o'clock and it is Saturday, November 6th. And this is the latest of Western Liberty Network's weekly Saturday Zoom sessions. Uh, today, in just a little bit, I'm going to be turning the floor over to Tom Cox, who is one of Western Liberty Network's uh, best trainers. And he'll be doing a training today on how to identify and defeat the tactics of Mr. Saul Alinsky, who uh, famously wrote the book, uh, Rules for Radicals, and is a standard playbook of uh, big government advocates in this country. Um, Western Liberty Network is a 501c3 organization. As such, we do not oppose or support any candidate, political party, legislation, or ballot measure. What we do is train grassroots activists in the skills necessary to be politically successful where they live. And if you would like to see more about Western Liberty Network, I'm going to share my screen now. You can go to the westernlibertynetwork.org website and you can see our homepage. And that's our homepage. And that's our good friend, Tom. Uh, we've been featuring his training through our social media outlets. And you can scroll down and see some of the past things that Western Liberty Network has been doing. Um, we've also got some other resources like uh, speeches of prior events that we have had that you can click on there. Um, we've got some good ones from pre previous conferences. The information is still timely. Uh, just scroll down and you can see what Western Liberty Network is up to. Um, two more people are coming in. So we're going to bring in Janet Bailey and Donna Blaylor. And so uh, if you would like to see what we offer, in terms of training resources, you can go to our training tab. Up top, we talk about the kinds of training we provide. Scroll down a little bit and you can download a variety of PDF documents on a variety of topics. These documents are meant to be handed out in conjunction with live presentations, but they stand on their own. So you can download those. They're not copyrighted. It's all about getting the information out. So if you see something you like, distribute it to whoever you wish. Um, then we've got our Saturday training sessions. This is one of them. Uh, this will be posted um, by the end of the weekend. And uh, we've got a variety of topics with a variety of different trainers. Uh, just scroll down until you see, I like the Brady Bunch one there. Scroll down till you uh, uh, see one you like and uh, just click on it and it'll start to play. And feel free to distribute links to those sessions wherever you like. And if you really support Western Liberty Network and want to help us, you can make a tax deductible contribution by going to our support tab. And you can do one-time contributions. You can do monthly contributions, which we just love because they're predictable, but uh, you can do all of that. And uh, so with that, I'm going to stop screen sharing. I'll come back. I think you can see me here. And at this point, I would like to thank everyone for uh, participating today and turn over the meeting to my good friend, Tom Cox. Thank you, Richard. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I very much love and respect folks who do grassroots political work. It's tremendously important. I believe that the, the foundation of the legitimacy of government rests on the active involvement of citizens like yourselves. And so anything I can do to help you, uh, I love to do. Anything I can do to help Richard and the mission of the Western Liberty Network, I'm happy to do. Uh, I'm an on again, off again donor uh, in part because I'm a consultant with a somewhat up and down income. Uh, but anytime the times are good, I'm given to Richard, uh, both in time and energy like today and in money. And I hope you will too. Yeah. Tom, can I interject for just a second? Please. Um, I would first like to thank you for the fact that although you are an on again, off again donor, uh, you are sometimes on. And uh, we're very grateful for the help that you've provided. I also, uh, given that you've just moved up to Washington from Oregon and uh, Ken Morse is here, I, I you know, neglected to highlight that our next annual conference is going to be in Vancouver, in Washington state at the Hilton Hotel, uh, recently remodeled. And it uh, looks like we're going to have a lot of really good speakers there, but and including a, a comedian, Joe Mackey, who you might've seen on the Gutfeld Show. And uh, a lot of leaders will have 20 breakout sessions uh, details. Uh, but anyhow, a number of the people who are on this call have been to our conference. So mark your calendar for February 5th with a reception to be held the night before on January 4th. You'll be able to sign up for the conference this week and hope we'll see you all there. And so with that, I'll stop talking and give it back to Tom. Super. And as soon as Richard grants me screen sharing powers, I'll put my screen up. <clears throat>
please hold during the silence. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Okay. So you should be seeing uh, the first page of my slide deck, Defeating the Tactics of Alinsky uh, with today's date. And uh, my name, in case you ever need to get in touch with me, Thomas Cox, president of Uday LLC, uh, which is my consulting firm. And uh, I am a former libertarian candidate for governor of Oregon in 2002. I was also a Republican candidate for treasurer some years after that. Uh, I had a registered Republican and they asked me to be their candidate one year. Uh, but enough, well, a little more background on perhaps a wee tiny bit. Uh, I was the candidate for governor. Yeah, I learned a ton uh, in that race. Uh, it was truly a transformative experience. I, I, had I won, it would have been even more transformative. But even the act of running for, uh, for uh, a public office can be uh, transformative. And it, that one certainly was for me. I, I think I became a better person, a better citizen for that. Uh, I went on to become uh, chairman of my state party in 2003. And as I say, GOP candidate for treasurer of Oregon some years after that. Uh, I've won awards as a Toastmaster. I am a management consultant and I specialize in leadership. And I've been attacked and I've counseled folks who've been attacked using the tactics of Alinsky. So let's talk about that. Um, what I want to teach you about today are what are these tactics? What doesn't work when you have these attacks used upon you uh, and why? Do, do, they, do they not work? And how can you uh, do things that do work? So quick summary of the tactics. What Saul Alinsky is famous for doing is giving uh, local political organizers a playbook to use to help local neighborhood groups, many of whom felt very detached and very um, impotent and ineffective, uh, to, to find a way to band together and be effective. And, you know, bless him for that. That's very similar to what Western Liberty Network does. It's a fine thing to do, depending on, of course, how one does it. Um, but he focused on the common enemy approach. And if he couldn't find one, he'd invent one. Uh, and he would uh, encourage people to hate and attack a particular individual. He also gave uh, his organizers a set of techniques for making a particular individual person the point of attack. It wasn't the institution, it was the superintendent, it was the chairman, it was the commissioner, it was someone very, very specific. Uh, he did not help create real relationships between groups or within groups. Uh, he was all about projecting power through mobilizing people to hate somebody. Uh, he took no responsibility uh, at any point in his life for the hate that he fomented. Uh, and he did get some results in the short term. Uh, I think he would have been a more effective person and maybe a better person if he'd taken the time to help people bond as human beings over a shared purpose. Um, but then we would be having a different seminar right now. People use his techniques because they work in the short term and they're simple and easy to teach. So what Alinskyites are trained to do um, is, is as follows, when, if and when you're attacked, and by the way, you should hope you are attacked. Uh, can, any, can someone guess why on earth uh, I would say that? You know, why would I want you to hope that you're being attacked? Uh, I'll ask that again here at the end. If you're attacked, they will seek to turn you into the scapegoat of their grievances. They will seek to isolate you from your support network, from your political allies. They will seek to ridicule you and goad you into overreacting. They will stick with tactics that their own people are very familiar with and are good at and use vague threats where one's imagination fills in the blanks. They'd much rather threaten a boycott than actually do the hard real world work of an actual boycott. Uh, and they try to keep the pressure on you constantly and relentlessly while varying their tactics within the the palette of things that their people are familiar with. Now that doesn't sound very pleasant. So why on earth would you hope that this might happen to you? Ken has a smile on his face and Richard I think has an answer as well. Uh, but if anybody else would care to either type or, or chime in, why on earth would you imagine I would say, gosh, you should hope they attack you. Not because it's gonna be fun. 
Ken's unmuting himself. No? All right, I'll just give I'll just give it away since no one wants to chime in. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, Ken's typing it. Yeah, they attack because they're vulnerable. Uh, and Carol says, because you threaten them. Yes, indeed. If you aren't being effective, they won't bother to attack you. They attack people that they're scared of. They attack where they are vulnerable. They attack where they feel threatened. And so if they're attacking you, you must be doing something right. Now, you may also be doing other things wrong. You don't imagine it's a blanket endorsement that you're flawless. You're not. Uh, but attacks by Alinskyites are often a sign of, of success and attraction. Uh, by the way, we'll come back to that later. So here's some of the things that don't work. Um, these are the responses that play into their hands. Number one, if you embrace being their scapegoat by replying as if you were indeed solely and completely responsible for whatever it is they did, and by the way, pretending as if what they claim you did is actually what you did. Don't, don't fall into that. Um, if you respond as an individual without support, that means that they've isolated you successfully. If you respond to ridicule at all, and especially if you respond by overreacting. Now, most of us will do that. I mean, how many of us have had practice, you know, in their adult life being ridiculed publicly? It's very shocking the first time it happens to you. And so one of the things I recommend candidates do or anybody who might be visible on a campaign, say for an, a ballot initiative or whatever, is prepare by looking at some of the unkind things that have been said about others and imagine them being applied to you and maybe even walk your family through. Now, you, someone might say things like X, Y, and Z. Richard says he gets it all the time. Uh, well, R Richard brings some of that onto himself. Let's, let's, uh, let's be candid. Uh, you, you, you need to prepare. Well, I'm getting into countermeasures already. Don't respond to ridicule and especially don't overreact, get defensive, try to explain yourself as if their criticism had some sort of merit. Um, don't remain defensive and don't just respond only to their initiatives. You need to take your own initiative. Don't allow vague threats into your imagination. Things like, well, there will be consequences. It's like, well, there's going to be a boycott and you're like, oh my God, I'm gonna go out of business. Ah. Right? You're, you're filling in the blanks with your imagination at that. Uh, don't let the pressure wear you down. They would love to exhaust you and burn you out and make you never want to do politics again. Um, because for them, politics is life. It's fun. They love the idea of everyone's life being run through some political process. They don't want to be left alone. They want to meddle in people's lives. That's what statists do. And so for them, this is all fun and, and delightful. It doesn't make them happy. They're actually some of those miserable people on the planet, but it is their hobby. And so they would love to drive you out of this arena and, and dominate it. And we can't let that happen. So what should you do instead? Ken says, pigs love to roll in the mud. True fact. Uh, here's some responses that can work. They're not guaranteed to work. There is, there's no guarantee here. They're gonna to have to play some of this by ear, get some advice, maybe practice some things um, off screen uh, with some friends or advisors. Uh, but here's some of the things you can do. Respond to the values underlying their grievance by agreeing with the value and pointing out what you're already doing to help. You know, they can say like, well, you're destroying the public schools. Blah, 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 blah. And, and you can say, well, what I'm hearing in this, you know, my, my beloved opponents uh, and I both agree that education for our children is absolutely incredibly important. But the difference is I'm actually the one making the difference here. And so you, you agree with the part, the thing underlying their complaint that is a point of agreement. And then now you're taking initiative. Uh, you can humorously decline to be made out as all powerful. You're destroying the schools. I, I am thrilled to imagine that, you know, I, I'm, that I could possibly have the power to single-handedly destroy or create or profoundly change all by myself, anything as huge as our public school system. Uh, and believe me, if I had that power, you'd be seeing a different school system today. Uh, what is true is that I stand for X, Y, and Z. So see, you make your statement, and what is true is, and then you have your own talking points, and now you're on your own agenda again. Use your own good humor to show that you're not bothered. 
uh, it's in the same vein as Reagan giving a little, little laugh and saying, there you go again. You know, so not that it bothers them. It's just kind of funny. Uh, anytime you can show good humor or show uh, that you're not bothered, number one, it reassures the public that you're not some emotionally fragile hand grenade waiting to go off as soon as you're in public office or that you're like somehow untrustworthy. You're a, you're a bastion of calm reason uh, that you are relaxed and capable. And they sound like lunatics. And the more you're stable and calm and good humored, the more ludicrous they look. Uh, this may be the most important one, and it's one of the hardest to learn at first. It's reframe, reframe, reframe. Um, I've sort of gotten good at it over time, but I, I, I wish I, I should probably do a, a whole module on just how to reframe. It's, it, um, I tend to do it sort of reflexively now. Uh, Ken, Ken's made a supporting point about good humor. Be the happy warrior on stage and off, actually. Um, let's talk about reframe for just a second. Um, I sort of alluded to it when, you know, your opponent or opponents or, or whatever pressure groups are trying to attack you claim you're, you know, Ken is going to destroy the school system. I know, or he wants to destroy, like they love to report your, your inner state. He wants this. Ken hates school. He hates teachers. I'm picking on Ken because he keeps typing and smiling. So he's, and, and I, I pick on Richard too much. So Ken's cool with it. Uh, and so the reframe is to just change the way of looking at it. Um, so he wants to destroy the schools. Actually, what I want to do is fix the schools. Period. Okay, so we're still talking about schools, but I'm just changing the verb. Or, uh, you know, you're right. He's a racist. You'll hear that, I'm sure. Everything's racist. Math is racist. Logic is racist. Western society is racist. Gravity probably is racist. I don't know. Um, and so it's like, look, somewhere underlying these complaints, I mean, they're touching on an important point here. Oh, really? Oh, he's about to agree. You know, uh, racial tensions are a big deal in our society. And, you know, America hasn't done enough to address many of the historic wrongs that uh, have harmed, you know, blacks and other ethnic minorities, and we need to do better. Uh, and my policies address that pretty directly. And here's why my policies will benefit uh, historically disadvantaged populations, and frankly, all students. And then off you go. I'm picking on schools because it's an easy topic, but it could be anything. Um, Arrange for third party allies to counterattack. You have to prearrange this to some extent and then you have to take it on the fly. So here's an example. There was a, a congressman or a member of the assembly uh, who introduced a budget or a bill and he was criticized from the left that his budget represented a holocaust for schools or whatever, something. And Rather than respond at all, his campaign got in touch with a group of Jewish rabbis who were sympathetic to him, and they criticized his critic for diminishing the actual Holocaust by using it in this trivial way. And he was disrespecting all Jews, and he was disrespecting history, and you know, blah blah blah, firestorm. Now he's on the defensive, and you know, the person who was attacked didn't have to say a word, didn't, didn't have to say anything publicly. That's a third party ally counterattack. Uh, it can be wonderfully effective, especially if it gets traction um, and it completely wrong foots the other person. Now you never have to respond to the criticism. So that, that's an example of a third party ally counterattack. Um, and I cannot stress enough the importance of good self-care routines. When you get into politics, you're getting into an or area of human activity where you're never done. And by that, I mean, whatever campaign you're working on, whatever initiative you're working on, whatever you know, grassroots organizing you're doing, there, no day will ever end where you finished everything you could have done that day. You will always finish the day with unfinished work. 
you will never have the satisfaction of like, I've shipped all the orders or I've responded to all the emails or I've done everything I could do that day. You will always, always literally have unfinished work. And if you allow yourself to obsess, you will sacrifice good diet, exercise, sleep, and family connections uh, and, and social support. And you must not do that because politics of the kind we're talking about, grassroots organizing and grassroots effectiveness to keep our democracy safe and functioning is an ongoing lifestyle activity. And you have got to just absolutely have the discipline of a soldier to eat well, sleep well, maintain your family connections, get good exercise, um, have incredibly good self-care routines. And the more intense the campaign, the more important that becomes. Uh, I've seen people you know, go gray over the course of a single campaign because of the stress they put themselves under. Uh, I've seen people have really tough relationships with their families, uh, health issues of various kinds, weight gain. It's not fun. Now, by contrast, I've seen people you know, use their races to remarkable effect. We had a candidate one time, Rich, I'll remember her, uh, who had never run before, ran for uh, a seat in the house, did a lot of door knocking. She, she'd never done politics before and she really took to it. And she found she liked talking to people in this new way. She made new friends. She got a lot of exercise. She changed her the way she dressed, the way she thought of herself. And she really transformed herself from kind of a, a a frumpy, middle-aged, not very happy person. She got a boyfriend out of it. Um, she looked terrific by the end of the race. I thought, my God, we should all run like her. Uh, and I don't know if she's doing politics anymore, if that was like one and done for her because she got her goals met. But I promise you that the habits that she used when she was running were the kinds of habits we all should use. So that's my, my note on good self-care routines. Um, you also want to inoculate yourself and your family and your, your followers, your donors in advance. Let me tell you what I mean by inoculate. How can you prepare in advance? Uh, think about the likely attacks. If you're, gonna, if you're doing something to do with schools, go through a couple of years worth of you know, blog posts and headlines and leftist talking points and figure out all the different things that might be said about you, not just the things that are rational to say, but irrational things that might get thrown at you anyway. And just make a list of them and know that many of them will be said about you and how you will likely respond. Prepare at least in your mind or maybe in some rough notes. I would memorize your, your response because you might sound like a robot, uh, but think about you know, when they say X, my response is, when they say Y, when they say Z, when they say W, when they say Z, whatever it is, if they attack me or my policies in these different ways, here are my responses. It doesn't take much time and it's kind of fun and you can share that load with other people running in a similar fashion. You know, two, three folks all running for school board, let's say, or water district or whatever it is. Uh, you'll have the same issues and you can share the same notes if you guys are allies and running in parallel with each other. Uh, where are you vulnerable to tropes? So uh, some of you may not know what the word trope is. Um, I put it in there specifically because it has a technical meaning. Um, a trope is kind of like a meme. It is a, uh, a unit of storytelling, if you will. So, uh, you know, if you are uh, a well-to-do older white man, you're going to have some older white man, you know, he's going to, he, he thinks he knows everything. And, you know, he's out of touch. Uh, the, you know, young person who has never done this before, oh, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, I think of it as stereotypes that might, do, might be deployed against you. The classic response, I'm not saying you copy this directly, but this is, has the, the, the heart of it, is uh, Ronald Reagan was old. He was pretty old to be elected president. He was older than I think anybody had, who had been elected up to that point. And he just, ha he just had fun with it. He didn't say that, oh, I'm, I'm young. He would say things like, uh, you know, George Washington once said, blah, blah, blah. And when he said that to me, you know, it really helped me take heart. Uh, or I'm going to campaign vigorously in all 13 states. You know, just funny stuff. Uh, on the debate with Mondale, I think it was, he said, I will. 
I will not make age a factor in this race. I will not exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience, which of course is the, you know miles from the truth. The guy had a ton of experience, but that's not the point. You know, take the trope and play with it, but don't be surprised by it. Notice how they're attacking other people. If they're attacking other people that way, they're likely to attack you. You got to get good at not taking it personally. I'm not sure if Richard's account is set up to do breakout rooms, Richard. If it is, I'd love to do that. If not, we can do it a different way. Uh, I don't know how to do break up, uh, breakout rooms it, on it, Zoom. It, I, I do, but it has to be enabled in advance, so let's not worry about it. Okay. Maybe next time when we do that, we'll, we'll have a chance to do a breakout. What I would typically do in a case like this is have you guys pair up and practice saying silly things with each other. It's like, yeah. you you hate gravity. You, know, <laughs> you, you want to give us away to Mars. You know, whatever, goofy stuff. And, you know. I already belong them. to Mars. Yes. But uh, uh, one thing, Tom, I wanted to interject here. Yeah. Is, um, believe it or not, when I ran for re-election in 2015 for the Twalton Valley Water District. Uh, uh, the Water District, the heart of power. The heart of power, that's right. In that race, my opponent uh, actually spent over $20,000 on a negative campaign against me, uh, which, um, oh, I forgot the name, a professor at Pacific University said on public radio that it was the worst hit piece he had seen in his 40 year career. And- uh, I hope you kept a copy. Oh, I have it, I'll send it to you. It's, it's I, I have the hit pieces that were run against me. I have a whole memento chest. Yep. And you know who it was too. So I'll, I'll be sure to, you'll, you'll get a charge out of it. But I anyway, it. Um, it was horrible. And I was home with my parents when it hit and it freaked me out. It really <laughs> did. It was, they spent 20 grand. I spent zero and, uh, um, you know, hit multiple hits to about 12,000 swing voter homes. And uh, it completely backfired on them. Um, it made national news for about two days. Uh, it was featured on the Mark and Dave radio show. Um, all of these different things. Uh, they um, Different newspapers endorsed me after never endorsing a water board candidate because of this. But the point is, you cannot take these things personally. Things will happen if you become effective. And they will make personal attacks. And you have got to realize that the people who attack you they don't know you. They don't know your family. They don't know anything about you. Or they your themselves character. don't even believe what they're saying most of the time. That's right. They're just attacking you. And if you allow yourself to take these things personally. Which you'll be tempted to do. Yep. You'll be tempted to do. You'll lose sleep at night. You will won't want to eat. It'll mess you up. I mean, that was a formative experience for me. Ever since then, when people threaten to do this or that, or they attack me in this way or that way, I'm like, eh. You know, it's no big deal. It's uh, this is business. This is politics. Richard Nixon famously said, if you want a friend in politics, buy a dog. Right. Um, in chess clubs and bowling clubs, we all sort of uh, join people who we like and who we enjoy spending time around with. With politics is different. You're joining people that have common uh, cause, but maybe very different personalities and you're not going to like them all and they're not all going to like you. Different and, values, different policy preferences, all sorts of things. That's right. And so uh, if you know that going in, you know, I'm, I'm getting involved in politics because I believe in these things and I want to accomplish these things. Understand that you will make some good friends, but you will also make a lot of enemies and people won't like you. And, and uh, you just have to not care. It is an acquired skill. But once you have acquired that skill, it is amazingly empowering and it makes yes. it much harder for Alinskyites to actually do damage to you. I'm sorry, Tom. No, I, I love the point. Thank you, Richard. And what will, another thing that will happen is, you know, people are watching you to see how you react because they're thinking, man, I'm glad I'm not running for office. This poor guy, is, the, I, is it even true? Does he really want to give away our water to Mars? Or whatever the goofy attack is. And, you know, when you are unflappable and calm in the face of nonsensical attacks or personal attacks, they go, wow, this guy's really like calm, cool, and collected, I respect him even more. Uh, and again, that's one of the reasons why you kind of want to be attacked a little bit. Don't, don't arrange it yourself. Don't pull a Jesse Smollett and, and arrange your own attack, um, please. But if you do happen to attract an actual attack, you know, the fact of you not taking it personally and, you know, 
looking for the, the, the point they're trying to make. Look, I think somewhere underneath all this vitriol, th there might be a valid point. The valid point is this, we need good schools. And you know, if my opponent's approach was gonna work, it would've worked by now. And I understand that change is threatening to some people. Uh, and we need this change. And the changes I'm talking about are gonna work. And here's why. And so I've, I've shown a little compassion. I've, I've painted them as, you know, they're scared of change. Those poor people. Uh, so it's very, it's relaxed. It's taking the high road. It's the kind of thing people love to see in their elected officials. Uh, oh, and the people championing uh, various public causes. Um, part of how you get good at not taking it personally is rehearsal. So again, if we were doing one of these in person, and I hope we will do some in-person trainings here, uh, I would really break you up into groups of two and three. You'd have a little handout and you'd practice letting people say nonsensical personal attacks at you and you're kind of letting it roll off. And there's nothing like practicing it. You think intellectually, I'll be fine. And then someone calls you something, you're like, Brrr. yeah, okay, shake it off, shake it off, walk around the block. <sighs> no, we're kidding, right? Okay. Um, a really good technique is improvisational theater training. Uh, can't ask if the handout's available. I haven't made the handout because it's not an in-person training. Sorry. I only make handouts when I know I'm going to use them. Uh, improv theater is terrific training for thinking on your feet and being emotionally resilient. It teaches you empathy. It teaches you listening skills. It makes you a great onstage performer for debates and discussions, panel, panels, things like that. I mean, I'm not improv comedy. I'm not talking comedy. I'm an improv theater. And in fact, I've taught uh, empathy to engineers using in improv theater exercises. I didn't tell them that's what it was. Um, and I've got the highest rating from the Project Managers Institute um, on record for that class. They just loved it. So there's some really good stuff out there. Other things you can do to prepare in advance, get lots of allies well in advance, make friends, make common cause, figure out, you know, hey, if I had been attacked in a certain way, you know, would you be willing to, you know, be the third party, party counterattacker or would you be willing to back me up? You know, are, are we in, in the same boat, if you will? Uh, and you make friends by volunteering on other people's campaigns, by circulating other people's petitions, by showing up to other people's events, um, by helping other people be effective. And when you do that, you make uh, lifelong friends. I don't know if you know that over 20 years ago, Richard was almost 30. My God. Richard was the best man at my wedding. Um, and Rich and I have been dear friends ever since. Um, Probably scraped the bottom of the barrel there. I don't know. Well, yeah, the dog would only play with me if I had a piece of meat hanging around my neck, but Richard was less picky. Uh, Ken had something to, to mention. Yeah. Um, can you see the, the book? Okay. The Pandora problem. Pandora problem. Tell yeah, us more about that. It's about dealing with narcissism in ourselves and in others. And I took this book and I used the principles in this book to build um, a comradeship in the conservatives in the local Thurston County Republican Party. And uh, we were able to get some real significant wins um, and also did some training on parliamentary procedure. But uh, you can diffuse, uh, um, I wouldn't say control, but um, you can reform a narcissist, uh, but it takes a community sticking together, standing up for each other. Um, and, and there's certain techniques to do this that are more successful. And this book talks about it. The author is wilder. Anyways, I recommend it. Thanks. Yeah, one more thing for me to read. I look forward to it very much. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, super. So I stopped screen sharing, so I want to make sure Ken got his book on screen. So include lots of allies, uh, and Ken just gave us an additional reason to do that. You mentioned narcissists. You will find people with personality disorders getting into politics for a couple of reasons. One, it can appeal to their grandiosity. Uh, there's two core reasons why people get into politics. Number one, to accomplish something, or number two, to be somebody. And the people who want to be somebody are utterly unreliable as allies. They don't know what they stand for. They don't care. They just want to be like, look at me, look at me. 
uh, and you can get narcissists very easily in politics. Um, also in politics, there's almost no barrier to entry. So any nut job can run for an office, can show up and give testimony, can, you know, it, there's, there's causes where they don't care what kind of a goofball you are. They'll, they'll take anybody. So you may find some people with some borderline personality disorders, uh, both among your allies and among your opponents, potentially. Uh, and so how you, how you handle people matters. And these are good life skills, as I think Ken just pointed out. Uh, practice reframing. Um, you know, if somebody said, you know, candidate X, had, you know, has never voted in a single election before now. Well, that's why I'm the best candidate. It's like, what? You know, because you see, you know, I, like a lot of potential voters, I was deeply disaffected. And now, dot, 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 I, you know, I'm, I'm seeing the light and I've decided to get active and I can bring others as well because, you know, now is the time to get active. Uh, Practice redirecting. What we should be talking about is X. Um, you can take this to an extreme and be careful you don't. But a lot of the time when people ask you questions on panels or in interviews, they'll ask you some questions. It's like the best question they could think of or some question somebody sent them or whatever, because they don't understand the issue as well as you do. And so you should feel free to take their question as a point of departure you know, like, I understand that you want to have children pray in school. And it's like, well, as long as we have tests, you can't stop kids praying in school, guys. Uh, but on chain, right? Um, and while I actually don't have that as one of my policies, what, what we should be talking about here actually uh, is, you know, freedom of expression for our kids. You know, whether it's worship or prayer or anything. Um, because my opponents have been silencing children and trampling on their First Amendment rights and uh, blah, 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 blah. So what we should be talking about is so you take the question, you may or may not respond to it, but you definitely take it the direction you want to. Now, if they repeat the question a second time in the exact same words, you have to answer it the second time around. But you should totally feel free to redirect. And again, that's something we can practice um, in, a, in a more comprehensive training. So I wanna, and we'll, I'll take questions here in just a minute, but I want to direct your attention here to this thing. It's called the OODA loop, O-O-D-A. If you've never seen this before, you're in for a treat. If you have seen it before, it's a reminder. Um, you start, everyone starts their OODA loop in the observe mode. Voters do, you and I do, everyone does, where you're trying to look around and see what, what's going on. And then the next thing you do is you orient. You're like, well, what does that even mean? Like people are banging pots and pans out on the street. Okay, I heard a noise, I went and observed it and I'm seeing people banging pots, what does that mean? And then orientation is when you try to figure out what that means, then you gotta decide what to do. Do I join them? Do I dump water on them? Do I close the window? Do I cheer them from a safe distance? Uh, and then having made the decision, you actually have to act and carry it out. This was originally invented by a guy named John Boyd, who was a fighter pilot for the United States. And when he explained this thinking and taught it to other fighter pilots, and it became doctrine with the US uh, Fighter Corps, Americans became the dominant uh, fighter pilots for several decades. Because what would happen is they would learn, they would train to go through this faster and faster to quickly notice what was going on and know what they would do in different circumstances. And if, if you and an opponent, say in a political campaign, are both you know, trying to do things and then you each have to observe what the other one did and orient to it and try to decide what to do about it and then take action. If one of you is faster through the loop than the other, while one of you is still trying to decide what to do, the other one's already taken an action and now you gotta observe new things and orient all over again. And this person who's slower through the loop can get paralyzed because things are happening too fast for them to figure out what to respond to, or they're responding to outdated information and the response no longer makes any sense. So what the Alinskyites would love for you to do is to be baffled and confused, unsure what you're observing, 
having a hard time orienting and either deciding to do the wrong thing or getting stuck trying to decide what to do, leaving them free to then do the next thing and the next thing to you. You can't let yourself get stuck in the middle. Of it. So that is why it's so important for you, if you're going to be active in politics, is to prepare yourself now so that when these kinds of attacks are thrown at you, you're not surprised, you're not baffled, you're not confused, uh, you're, you're flattered. You can even say that. You know, it's, it's, it's flattering to be attacked, you might say, and explain why. Uh, Ken has a quick comment about allies. Is that still correct or have we moved on? Oh, political version of a traffic roundabout, says Ken. Yes. It's, it's, in fact, it's, it is a traffic roundabout. No, it's not. Sorry. Um, but it looks a little bit like one. So questions, comments, thoughts. I'm wondering what's standing out in your mind, either from this slide or the slide right before, uh, that is speaking to you, that makes sense to you, that gives you, you know, either, either you're confused and puzzled by it, or you're encouraged by it, or just whatever reaction you're having. And I'm actually going to call each of you by name and ask you to type something in the chat, starting with Carla, Carolyn, and Cheryl, as well as Donna, Elaine, hi, Elaine. Is it Jenea, Janet, Ken, Michelle, and Carla? I think, oh, Carla went twice. Never mind. Carla only asked this one once. Oh. Hey, Ken. Yeah, I, I just want to encourage everyone to. Um, um, you know, get your, your political friends or your friends together and, and do these sorts of practicing. And that's what we did at Thurston County with um, um, uh, parliamentary procedure. What we did is uh, we talked about it for about two, three meetings. And then we finally, someone says, yeah, let's use parliamentary procedure in our meeting right now, because the meetings had been um, more social than productive. And, um, and by doing so, uh, we were able to uh, practice um, doing a motion, practice appealing to the decision of the chair, practice point of order. <laughs> and so we had fun with it. And then when it came time to um, uh, go on the offensive, so to speak, in an actual meeting, uh, we were uh, standing up for each other. We were supporting each other. We knew how to do it. We knew just about five different parliamentary procedures and we turned the tables totally. And so it was, uh, you know, the, the, we were having weekly meetings and uh, we were talking about issues and then we started to practice and then bam, we rolled, up, we rolled them like a steamroller. Um, to, to put it in their terms, they, they were pretty set back by it and uh, they eventually recovered and all, but um, <laughs> it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. So practice with your friends, get together, encourage each other, stand up for each other when you're out there in the thick of the battle. It'll make a huge difference. Thank you much, Ken. So Carla, Carolyn, uh, maybe lost Cheryl, Donna, Elaine. So let's see, Carol, Carol's typing. Watching the verbal attacks on Mansion and Cinema was classic Walensky. The way they responded showed me they knew how to react and diffuse. That is some very alert noticing by Carolyn. Thank you. Uh, Carla says, coming at this as a very small business owner that doesn't want to support the mandates, want to be prepared for what may come. So that's some background on her. Uh, so Donna. Elaine, Shania, Michelle, I'd love to get your, your thoughts in, but even just right, hey, Jen. I think one of the important things is to be prepared because when you're prepared, you have confidence and then you can speak um, on, on topics that you maybe aren't even asked. You can divert with, um, with other pertinent issues. Here, here. Thank you, Janet. Let's see. Um, Donna. Donna has not responded yet. I'm hoping Donna's interested. And uh, Elaine, your thoughts. Oh, Elaine, you're muted. There you go. I, I think that it's important to um, know the tactics of Sololinsky 
for anyone who is involved with politics at every level. Mm. Um, this is a very valuable training and um, I appreciate it very much and appreciate uh, the result of your experience with it. So thank you. Thank you, Elaine, very much. Yes, thank you. It, it is very informative. I'm not in politics, but I'm in school board issues and- um, You're in politics then. So, uh, yeah, I am. I'm not running for anything, but I'm boots on the ground every yeah. day. Don't you get a kick out of these people who are running for, well, particularly governor, I've been hearing it. A lot of candidates are saying, well, I'm not a politician. Well, you're, yes, you are. You're asking for a vote. You, you're, you you're, are a politician. Yeah, you you filed to run for an office and you're asking people to vote for you. That you're By definition, you're a politician. You're a, that's right, that's right. I think what they're trying to say is that they're not a professional politician, meaning that they don't think it should be a career, you know, a la Harry Reid or, folks like that, but uh, I don't know, that's my two cents. Another way of approaching that would be say, I'm not just your ordinary politician, I'm different because of such and such, and that's why you should vote for me. So it's, it's framing how you frame it. Mm -hmm. true. That's true, that's true. Uh, so I mostly recruit for school board candidates and then encourage them to run and help them through the process. And now that we've already elected, um, encourage parents to be motivated to speak at school board meetings, guide them and uh, mentor them on what to say and how to present. Got it. Uh, so Janae wrote that uh, point number two really stood out for her. I just stopped screen sharing because I wanted us to see each other, but I'll pull it back on the screen. Point two about not taking it personally was really uh, resonated. For, for Janine. Uh, Janine, am I pronouncing your name correctly? I always worry about pronunciation. Uh, but her point was that it, number two stood out because becoming desensitized to attacks helps you not take it personally. Um, and often the people who are attacking you, you know, if you win office, and I hope you will, um, those same people are gonna have to come talk to you. And if you didn't take it personally, they probably willing to work with you. And once they work with you, they'll probably not like hate your guts. They'll be like, yeah, he's actually an okay person. Uh, as opposed to if they're so ashamed of themselves in their own overstatements uh, and they, they can't work with you, then they'll really want to get rid of you because you remind them of their own shame. And so there's, uh, there's also a, a route to, I believe, um, forgiveness and, uh, and compassion. Oh, Leo points out that trope is her last name. Nice. Uh, Richard points out we want to mark February 5th, Sunday, on your calendars for the WLN 12th Annual Leadership Activist Training Conference, uh, being held in Vancouver, Washington, including a free reception held the night before. And depending on the state of pandemic lockdowns and my, my wife's own health, I have taken to not traveling at all because we've got uh, a need to stay away from various contagions. Uh, but if I'm available, I'll come. And if not, I'll, I'll zoom in if you guys are doing Zoom stuff. But uh, I would love to support that event on February 5th. Uh, I think people are mostly out of questions and comments. And uh, so at this point, Richard, I'll, I'll hand control back to you and, and thank you for inviting me in and giving me a chance to help make a difference. Okay, well, you do make a difference. Um, I see in the uh, evaluation forms that come from our conference that uh, your trainings are among the most popular and the most practical. And uh, over time, that means among the most effective. So we're always happy to have you on board. Um, got a nice turnout today. I wanna to thank every one of you for participating. Uh, look forward to seeing all of you at the conference. But in the meantime, uh, we've got things coming on. We've got a live training in Columbia City on Monday. We've got other ones uh, coming up later in the week. And uh, we're getting ready for the uh, conference on February 5th. So with that, we will call it a day. And I hope to see you next week when we will be doing training on another topic at 1 p.m. Pacific time at the same location. Thank you very much and God bless. God bless you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you all.